Um, first of all, I want to thank the Wheeler Center, obviously, um, and I'd like to thank Yumi and her really cute kids who are down at front. Um, Anna Lensky, who organized absolutely everything for me today, and also the Festival of Dangerous Ideas, because wow, am I a dangerous person, as you will see. Um, you know, I'm always introduced as America's worst mom. Um, Got to have a gimmick if you want to get ahead. Uh, uh, you know, whether, whether I am uh, the worst mom or not, I guess you get to decide. Um, I am a mom. Um, and that means that I am always talking to other moms, because that's what we do. And one day, a couple of years back, I was talking to my friend Melissa. And Melissa was saying to me, can you believe she did that? And I'm like, did, did what, Melissa? What are you talking about? And here's the story. Um, Melissa had been at Costco. I know Costco is a new thing for you, but it is very, very popular in the United States um, because we buy giant pallets of food routinely, um, as you can probably tell if you ever watch American shows. And um, so Melissa had been at Costco, and she was waiting in line with her pallet of the equivalent of, you have barbecue shapes, you know, she had these mounds of goldfish crackers and rice krispies and just the usual giant thing of groceries. And she was there with her children who were five and two at the time, two little girls. And the lady behind her in line tapped her and said, oh, excuse me, I forgot to get, uh, you know, enough tuna fish to last uh, till Mars. Um, <laughs> would you mind watching my son for a second while I go, you know, three miles back and get the tuna fish? And um, Melissa said, sure. And that's when she was saying to me, can you believe she did that? And I'm like, forgot the tuna? Melissa, I always forget that. You know, you always see me going back and forth. She goes, no, Lenore. I could have taken her baby, and she would never have seen him again. And I'm like, that's, that's what you think was crazy that the woman did? And Melissa's like, yes. And I'm like, oh, let's just take this step by step for a second, Melissa, and see, so what, let's just think what this would entail. Um, first of all, it would require you uh, being a baby-snatching kidnapper, uh, one, one of the few who already has two little children of your own, and yet wants a third, uh, you know, something that most of us use birth control for. You want this other child. Okay, so then you would have to simply turn around, uh, leave your two kids for a second, and, like, try to yank the kid, these little boys in the, the cart, you know, yank their little fat feet out of the cart, and you're pulling them, and then you have to, like, I don't know, put them under one arm, and then you have to grab your own two-year-old, and you have to sort of shove your five-year-old along, and then you have to start going out, you know, with them, and your, your five-year-old is saying, what about our barbecue crackers? And your two-year-old is saying, why are you stealing that other lady's baby? I'm the baby. And like, shut up, kid, and you're going by all the other people. You're, you're leaving your groceries. You're leaving your place in line at Costco. Have you seen the lines at Costco? So you're going by all them, waving the cashier. You get there, and, and in America, because we're such trustworthy, the people, when you get to the final door to leave, there's a lady who looks at your receipt to make sure you're not stealing anything. Does this match with this? With that? No, we had this other lady's baby. Like, shut up, kid. We got to go. <laughs> so then you're getting out there. And, and remember, this is, this is your first baby snatching, so you're a little nervous. I mean, you're really lucky. I mean, how many baby snatchers have them just dropped in their lap in public? You know, you've been pursuing that low-yield strategy, but you got one, okay? So now, now you're like, I got one, yay! It's like the lottery. And then you're looking around for your car, and you're nervous, and you're beep, 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 finally you find the minivan, and you run out there, and you got one kid here, and you got one kid there. You open the door, and then you get the, the five-year-old can strap her own self in. That's good, but the two-year-old, you got to put her in the car seat, and then you don't have a car seat for the baby. You know, that, that's illegal. <laughs> you know, so, so you have to, you know, Melissa believes in car seats. Obviously, she's a good mom. She's going to be a mom of three. Um, so now she has to, like, take the laundry basket. And in New York, you, like, you, have, to, you have to put them backwards facing when they're till six months. But is he seven months? He should be facing forward. You know, she puts him in the car seat. And then she closes all the doors. And she puts on the DVD of Arthur or whatever. And then she's gunning it across state lines. The minivan is going room. And she thinks the other lady was crazy. <laughs> so that's my big question when I talk about free range kids. Who is crazy? The ones who think we can trust our children in the world for maybe a couple of seconds when we don't have our eyes right upon them, like a maximum security prison, 
or those who assume that pretty much everyone, uh, including themselves, <laughs> is a predator, pedophile, baby-killing nutcase. Um, so when I heard this story, I'm a New York City columnist. I had a column back then before my paper died. Anyway, we won't get into my other story, my sad personal journalism story, which you can hear at length at over drinks later on. Um, <laughs> I did write a column about Melissa's story, and I thought it was going to set the world on fire because it was so obvious we're going through this weird parenting moment, right? And so I typed it up, I sent it in, it gets in print, New York Daily News, and I got um, three emails, um, two saying, someday you're going to be America's worst mom. No, <laughs> how did they know? Um, no, and one from my elderly admirer on Staten Island, the really least glamorous part of New York City, um, 80-year-old guy, and he's like, she wasn't crazy, but I'm crazy for Lenore Skenazy. And, you know, he, 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 I love him. He writes to me. I love him. Um, so that was it. It fell into uh, the dust heap of history. And um, nothing else happened. I continued writing my columns until a couple years later, uh, my nine-year-old um, at the time, Izzy, started pestering me and my husband would you please take me somewhere? I swear to God, this was his idea, not ours. Would you, not even my book agents. Um, would you please take me somewhere and um, let me find my way home on the subway? Um, so my husband and I looked at each other. We have an older son who never asked this. So we had to think about whether this made sense as, to us as parents and, and for him as a kid. We thought, well, you know, we are on the subways all the time. This is how we get around. This is a normal part of our day. It's not the taking of Pelham 123. I've never seen John Travolta in the subway. I've never seen Will Smith. I've never seen an alien. Well, I've seen illegal aliens, but I've never seen um, a, like a supernatural alien. And the rats don't have guns. So it's just a, a rather normal place to be crowded, busy, and, um, and our son is very familiar with it too. He can read a map. My husband sat on the ground of our living room and made sure you know, understand what the subway lines are, and he did. Um, if you ever wonder why you can't get a map in New York City, it's because for a while he was collecting them all. You know, he's one of those kids. So he can read a map, he speaks the language, um, you know, he sort of knows his way around. We decided, okay, yeah, let's let him do it. And so one sunny Sunday, um, I took him to Bloomingdale's, which is the fanciest, schmanciest store um, that just happens to sit right above a subway station. And um, I said, okay, today's the day, and he was very excited. And I left him in the handbag department um, because, yes, to me, it seemed a little amusing. Oh, I left my son. Oh, silly me. <laughs> Where was he again? I just saw this beautiful bag. Oh! <laughs> um, <laughs> but I left him there deliberately because the handbag department is right near the door, and when you go out the door... You're in the subway, basically. And, and he knew this was the day, so I said, okay, and I went the other way. And sure enough, he went down in the subway, and he talked to a stranger who said, oh, I'm going to bring you to Melissa. You know, this is just great. <laughs> She's been waiting. <laughs> right. Now, he said, my son said, is this the way downtown? And the guy said, no. How scary is that? No. He actually gave him directions. You go up and over, and he went up and over, and he went down, and he took the train downtown for maybe 10 minutes, Got up on 34th Street, miracle on 34th Street. He took the bus across by himself, my nine-year-old, and, um, and got home, you know, maybe 45 minutes later, and he was just happy. He was pleased. He had done something finally. His parents let him do something grown up. And me, with my keen nose for news, honed by years of tabloid experience, didn't write about it. Um, because it wasn't a big deal. It was just something nice that he'd done, you know, just sort of like, would you write a column about when your kid finally rides the bike? You know, you would if you're one of those columnists who writes about everything about your kids. But I, fortunately, at that point, hadn't become one of them yet. Um, so, uh, so I didn't write about it until like a month later when I was staring at a deadline and I didn't know what to write about. And interestingly, I had a woman editor finally. I said... Uh, how about I write about um, my son when I let him take the subway by himself when he was nine? Because, um, you know, I talked to some of the other fourth grade parents and they thought that was, seemed a little early or whatever. And my editor said, sure, that's a nice local story. And, and here I am in Melbourne, okay? <laughs> so I wrote about it, blah, 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 blah. I let him take the subway. I don't think everybody's so terrible, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that night the phone rang and... Um, and it was a guy from 
Uh, the Howard Stern Radio Show. Uh, I, 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 I hear a ripple, which suggests to me that you know that who Howard Stern is and generally the tenor of his interviews, which you'd think uh, would involve me you know, taking off many layers, beginning with my scarf and ending with nothing at all, for him to be interested in me, because that's what Howard Stern is writing about, strippers. He likes strippers and... Um, I, I can't even say, in front of these darling little girls, um, you know, for another, another 10 years, they won't know. But that's, that's the Howard Stern show, and I was just surprised that they would be interested in this story because it seemed a little offbeat. Um, I, I hadn't sold him into sexual slavery. I had simply put him on the subway. Um, so then, later on, uh, the, put the phone down, the phone rings again, and it's the equivalent of your Sunrise show calling, and I'm like, that's... That's quite a, a gap there. You know, unless you are uh, Tiger Woods' mistress, um, most people, you know, you, you wouldn't be called by both shows. So it was my first hint that this was a story that resonated with people. And sure enough, um, two days later, I had been on um, the three major networks in America and our equivalent of the ABC defending my parenting choices and trying to say that I wasn't America's worst mom. Um, but... While I was on the ABC show, um, one of the callers called up, and he couldn't talk to me directly because I was such a loathsome pimp who had put my son in uh, hell uh, just to get a column out of it. Um, so he had to talk to the host, and he said what he didn't understand is why that woman uh, had wanted her son to have one day of fun and freedom that would probably end with him uh, raped, murdered, dismembered, and possibly eaten um, when she could have given him a long and happy life. And I'm like, they seem like the same thing. You know, six of one, half a dozen of another, long and happy life, raped, dismembered, and eaten. I don't know. You know, I have a spare son at home. You know, I, I really wasn't worried. I needed a column. You know, why would I worry about sending my son into hell? So the fact that people were thinking of me like that, that every conversation went to, why did you put your son in danger, made me go home and start my blog that weekend. And I called it Free Range Kids. And... It was there, it says right on the side of it, I haven't changed the word since I put it up two years ago, it's like, I love safety. I believe in safety. I want my kids to be safe. I want all kids to be safe. I believe in helmets, car seats, seat belts. When, when the intrepid subway rider turned 10 and we had a football party for him and, uh, you know, at the end you give everybody a goodie bag, did I give them candy in their goodie bags? Did I give them a toy? I gave each... Little darling child, a protective mouth guard. And I, I, I personally boiled them in the kitchen and then blowed them off so it wouldn't burn anybody and stuck them in their mouths so that they would be perfectly formed around their darling little teeth so nobody would get hurt. So the idea that I embrace danger was so bizarre to me that I wanted to explain I love safety. I just don't believe our children need a security detail every time they leave the house. Well, it wasn't until I started that site that I started to hear even more about how nervous we have become as parents today. Um, what I didn't realize, because I lived in New York City, is that in the suburbs, um, like where I grew up, where we used to walk to the bus stop and you'd wait for the bus to take you to school, parents now drive their children to the bus stop. And they don't even then let the kids out, they, they wait at the bus stop to make sure the bus and not the boogeyman is going to come and pick them up, and then when each child is on the bus, then they can drive off. And in some neighborhoods, the bus doesn't go to the bus stop anymore. The bus stops at each individual house, like the kids are like, <laughs> it's like vomiting. By the time they get to school, they've made so many stops. And what do the parents do to show they care and to keep their kids safe? If, if the bus is stopping there, what can you do? You drive your child from the garage to the sidewalk. They do this. I mean, I heard about it once or twice, and I thought, is this true? And I asked on my side. I got 200 letters. Yes, it's true. Parents are driving their kids from the house to the sidewalk and waiting for the bus to pick them up there. And that's getting to school. Pickup is insane. In states across America, at the end of the day, 
you know, the few kids that are trusted to go on the bus, you know, by the parents who don't care, those kids go to the bus, right? But then the rest of the kids who are the pickup kids are herded together, like, like in a bomb shelter, down into the gym. And then the parents start lining up, parents, let's be honest, the moms start lining up um, around a half an hour before school lets out because there's so many of them. 50% of American kids now get picked up after school. That's why it's called pickup. It used to be dismissal. Kids would be dismissed. Now they get picked up. So the cars are in a huge line. And then ding, 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 it's the end of the school day. Okay, so the first car pulls up to the front of the line and there's a person standing there in the parking lot. And I always imagine it must be the gym teacher. But it's somebody there who works at the school and she's got a walkie-talkie and on the dashboard of the car is the name of the kid it says okay okay uh it's the gym teacher k k sorry <laughs> k k caitlin's mom caitlin's mom is here okay caitlin's mom is here okay caitlin's mom is here okay oh caitlin your mom is here caitlin come on okay caitlin is grabbed from the gym she's escorted out they go down the corridor they go outside the door is open for caitlin she's shoved in like Obama, the door slams. <laughs> Out goes Kaylin. Okay, Sydney's mom is here. Sydney's, si si somebody's mom is here. Okay, so go, go Sydney. Sydney is rushed out there, thrown into the car. The next one. Okay, Jimmy's mom is here. Okay, Fred's mom is here. Okay, go, go. And it just seems like there's like helicopters and sniper fire and explode. It's like the fall of Saigon. Get out while you can. Go, go, for God's sake, go. And that's just dismissal at normal American schools. It blew my mind to hear how afraid we are for our children these days. And I heard just example after example. Um, in England, the Boy Scout boys can no longer carry pen knives, okay? In America, where they can, um, one scout leader was teaching the kids how to whittle. You know, this is how you take a stick, duh. And uh, you take a knife, he showed him how to whittle, and then each child was handed a potato peeler, okay? <laughs> right? Because you can't be too safe. Just can't be too safe. Girl Scouts, on the other hand, are still allowed to toast marshmallows, provided they have one knee on the ground. Why? Otherwise, they're all toppling into the fire. We were just having, you know, generations of Girl Scouts going up like Joan of Arc. <laughs> and, and on and on it goes. I just heard an amazing story today. Listen to this one. This is really sad. Uh, a journalist here whose name is Caitlin, which is why it came to me, told me that her friend, who's male, was here in Melbourne at a grocery this week. Is you raising your hand? Um, and he was, you know, he was shopping. Imagine that. Um, not actually there to prey upon children. And um, <laughs> he was going down an aisle, and he saw a little kid in the cart, and he waved at the kid in one aisle, and then, boop, wouldn't you know it, the kid comes down this aisle with the mom, and he sees the kid in the other aisle, and he waves again, and by the time he's in the next aisle, the manager came and said, we are asking you to leave. <laughs> you know, you can laugh, but that's the way we're thinking about every interaction these days, as if any human interest in a child must be perverse, as if the children are in danger when they're with their mom at the grocery and somebody is waving. That used to be considered nice, and now it's considered scary, if not downright criminal. So what I wanted to figure out is, is it just my imagination, or have things really changed since when I was a kid? And I was doing my research and I was hearing all these stories, but I am middle-aged, and middle-aged people always tend to think things were better when they were kids. And then I found the smoking gun that proves that childhood really has changed, or at least what we think of as childhood and the way it should be has changed. And that is, I got the DVD of Sesame Street Old School. It's a two-DVD set, and it shows the Sesame Street, um, highlights of Sesame Street from 1969 to 1974, the first five years they were on the air. See, I've, I learned my math from Sesame Street. Five years, 1974. Um, and so uh, it shows stuff that seemed very familiar. It shows um, kids playing follow the leader, and the leader is not, you know, getting her PhD in follow the leader studies. She is actually another six-year-old. Um, it shows kids playing in a vacant lot. They haven't put that soft Pepsi mat stuff on the ground yet. It's a real vacant lot, um, or at least it looked like it on Sesame Street. And, and the kids balance on a beam, and there's one of those giant pipes, and they shimmy through the pipe. There's, there's like nobody sleeping in the middle of the pipe. You 
know, they go through the pipe, they come out at the other end, and they're just having a grand time, and they're not supervised, they're playing, you know, remember that playing thing? And, and before you see any of this, a warning appears on screen at the very beginning, and it says, the following is intended for adult viewing only. Sesame Street could not endorse the very childhood, you know, they didn't take home movies and put them on the screen back then. They went out and they were trying to model childhood for children back then. They were trying to show what was healthy, what all the child psychiatrists and psychologists and educators thought would show a really healthy, happy childhood. And they could not even endorse their own halcyon days as their sunny days anymore. I, my friend actually works at Sesame Street. And I asked him about this. He's a lawyer. How embarrassing is that? I said, you, you guys, didn't you feel like idiots? You know, you can't endorse your own Sesame Street anymore? And he said, yeah, there were a lot of discussions. Of course, there were a lot of discussions. I'm sure they're paid by the hour. A lot of discussions. <laughs> and finally, they just couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. So when I went to write my book, I really wanted to figure out how did we get to the point where a little girl walking down Sesame Street, um, you know, meeting the neighbors was now so horrible that we were all scared for her and that we thought Mr. Hooper was probably a creep who should be sent out of his own grocery store. So um, I, I did my research and I came up with what I think are four things that have changed since um, we were kids um, compared to now when a lot of us are raising kids. And the first one is very obvious. It's the me, meaty, meaty, media. You can say it. It's the media. Come on. Don't you guys routinely blame the media like we do? I mean, that's like a national pastime. Um, and it's our media. You, you should be blaming us. Um, so yes, the fault is the media because it has changed dramatically. When my parents were raising me, I am so old. Um, did you guys have Marcus Welby? I mean, like, that's what was on TV. Remember? The patients lived, <laughs> right? <You know? laughs> Nobody sued, <laughs> right? Marcus Welby patted them on the back. Nobody said, don't touch me. You know, it was a totally different era. And, and when they watched the news, the news actually had a beginning and an end. <laughs> Imagine that. It didn't go on for 24 hours a day like it does now. And when you have 24 hours to fill, you you really have to come up with some great story that will keep people tuned in. And as it turns out, the greatest story for the news media that they have ever found that will keep us on edge, that will keep us so sad and so gripped that we have to watch the TV, it almost feels disloyal if we turn off the TV, is the story of a kidnapped child. And when I first got here, I don't know, I was telling this to Carrie O'Brien, if I may name drop. Um, the first, I, find, I turned on my TV in my hotel room here in Sydney, and I, I recognized the footage. I was like, I've seen this footage before. It was the footage of J.C. Dugard, who had the very tragic history of being snatched from a bus stop in California, not on this continent, not in this hemisphere, um, at age 11, and, um, and finally being found again at age 29. Um, why was that story a story here? Um, because it is so rare you had to import it. It's like saffron. It's like something that you will go to the ends of the earth to get. Why do we all know the name Maddie McCann? Maddie McCann wasn't even in my country. She wasn't in your country. She was in continent number three. We've got three continents covered with the story of Maddie McCann because it, is, it fits the perfect template for the story that television wants to tell us. It was a girl who was white who disappeared, who had kind of well-off parents. And that is a story that they will go and, and they're laying off my friends right and left, but these stations have enough money to send the camera crews out there when that story happens. And it gets to the point where, I found this out after I re researched my book actually, there's something called mean world syndrome, which I wish I'd known about first, which is that the more TV you watch, the more mean you think the world is. And it's not just because we keep seeing these stories over and over again. It's because you see Maddie McCann, and then you see an ad for tomato sauce. And then you see J.C. Dugard, and you see an ad for toilet paper. And the mundane stuff mixes with this very rare stuff, and it starts feeling all mundane. It starts feeling like it's all just part of the fabric of life. And like when I told my friend about the, the Izzy story, she said, because she lives in New York with me, she said, of course he's safe here because she's familiar with New York, she said, but aren't they getting just snatched off their bicycles all the time in the suburbs? I mean, it really feels 
like because 24-7 we see these children snatched on TV, we assume that we open the door and that's what's happening outside. And, and it's not just the news media that reinforce this. I mean, there's all those television shows that we gleefully export to you, like CSI and Law and & Order, and Law and & Order, and, and they're Law and & Order, and then <laughs> there's Law and & Order. Um, and so the night before I was writing my chapter on the media, I decided, let me just randomly see what's on TV. And sure enough, <laughs> what a surprise, Law & Order was on TV, and it wasn't even SVU or whatever, you know, the one with the really cute victims. This was only the moderately cute victims. Um, but still, I watched, um, you know, nothing else on. I'll watch the moderate cute ones. And, um, and the plot was this. Uh, a girl was coming home from school, of course, and who should be lurking um, but ye old Serbian war criminal? Uh, <laughs> because nothing says friendly neighbor, you know, like a Serbian war criminal. Well, next thing you see, she's been dragged off the street. She's in his basement. Her arms are, you know, tied above her head like that by, by a phone cord, which shows you it's fiction because... Who has a phone cord? Uh, but anyways, so, so her hands are tied. She's lying down. There's a blindfold over her eyes. There's duct tape over her mouth. And all we hear are rah, 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 horrible, terrifying, awful, guttural sounds. And we see the man's hand reaching to go between her thighs and then cut to... The, you know, the tomato sauce commercial, you know, because that's entertainment. So then, um, you know, the worst of the worst happens there. And then I'm watching CSI. Um, forget about the news where it had somebody on fire and somebody else who killed himself. But CSI finally comes on. And I, I must admit, I am slow enough. I could not follow the plot one iota. But I can tell you the basics, which are that... Um, the, the red-haired guy was down there in Miami, and, um, and of course there was a body in the swamp, and they had to pull the body out of the swamp, and then I think they count like the maggots to see how many days it had been there, or they cut through the maggots. Somehow the maggots were very involved in this story. And, and then some guy, then there's a key, a very important key to like a bank account or something, but a guy has a key, so he's not going to give the key away, so instead, ha-ha, he swallows the key. Who can swallow a key? He swallows the key, and they want to get the key, so what do they do? They take a knife. Somebody takes a knife, they slice open the guy. Oh, look, I got the key. You know, so they got the key. And then the next thing you see, you're in somebody's bathroom, and a lady is being drowned like this. It's the same soundtrack all the time. And, and then she gets her head out, and you're like, oh, thank God. And then, oh, she's back down again. Don't want to waste the soundtrack. And finally, oh, my God, she gets out, and you're so happy. She's saved, but she's so dazed. She's, like, twirling around, and she ends up, ah, she impales her breast on the towel hook, you know. I, I hate it when that happens. You get up, you're feeling good, you take your shower. Oh, the breast, the to towel hook. It's just terrible. So that way they get to show breast, you know, but it's all of the point for the, for the plot. And so it was just like this disgusting mess of maggots and blood and death and gore and breasts and towels not having a hook, um, you know, <laughs> that it was just amazing to me. And, and I was very happy to find a study that looked at this mess. And it looked at, it was from the Mayo Clinic, very prestigious clinic back in America, that um, looked at two seasons of crime on CSI and two seasons of crime in that thing, uh, uh, real life, that's it, real life, that, that thing out there that you shouldn't go to, it's so scary. Um, and they compared them and they found three big discrepancies. <laughs> 